Whitney Farmer, your instructor for Grace's TOEFL test prep, a free class for you. And I'm very glad to be returning to you. I think that uh, many of you last time I was able to meet with you a couple of weeks ago heard that I was in the process of a big family move. Our family is moving our mother from the place she has been for the last, you know, eight years with our father who passed away last year. We're moving here to a new location and still in the process, but we got a lot of it done. And on um, the, the WhatsApp group that we're in, I think that you probably saw me describing to you how I have complete newfound respect for anyone who wants to go through a move. I mean, a lot of my friends within the community here have moved from across the world to be here, and I can't even imagine that. We had trouble moving five blocks. But um, like I said, I'm very, very pleased um, to be returning to you right now and to pick up where we left off. Um, last time, last time we were talking about, I was receiving some information about um, different responses to a video that I posted on our WhatsApp group as well as on our Facebook. So today what I want to do is I want us to listen to one of those samples and through that sample, this is a very brave woman, her name is Merla, she was able to provide it to me, it's an audio sample, not a video, and someone told me actually that for some of you you're a little bit shy when it comes to providing this kind of uh, um, attempt at English and I completely understand that. In future, if you'd like to provide audio content instead of video, which includes your picture as well, that's completely okay. Memna was the one who was first out of the gate, brave heart, and she was able to give us, um, I think, a really good audio clip that has a, a lot embedded in it that I want to highlight and describe to you as well as to her so that we all together can learn it. But before I do though, I wanted to, I wanted to tell you something. Um, as part of this move that I was going through, I was reminded about a time when I went to visit my family back in New York City. And uh, my little sister, um, we went to Ellis Island and it was just after it had been renovated and restored and was open again to the public. And everyone always goes to the Statue of Liberty, but I was able to visit Ellis Island and to walk through the areas where those who were newcomers to America came. Um, there was a, a really long staircase that went up and it had a name of, of, uh, that was connected to tears because what would happen is people would enter into American soil and they had to go through checks and health checks and sometimes quarantine. So at the top of the stairs, families sometimes were separated. The left, people would go and they would be able to reach the mainland. To the right was to the hospital area where they would be treated for any illnesses that they had coming through. And in those times, there was often uh, tuberculosis or consumption, as they called it, or typhoid and, and all different kinds of things. But but in the midst of that, in the midst of that, these families came from tremendous hardship with tremendous bravery and came to that first port of entry. There were a few different ones, but I again had the, the um, pleasure of being able to be on Ellis Island. Um, as you go through that area, and if you come to America and go to, the, to New York City, if you can travel through there and, and tour it, it's very compelling. There were a couple of things that were really, um, really captured my interest. One of them is there are books there and every single name, every single name of anyone who ever came through Ellis Island and immigrated to America before they closed it down as a port of entry, every name is written in that book. And there's also an audio, you can listen to every single name that was, that was ever attached to an immigrant, a newcomer who arrived on our shores. That was very interesting because each of those names embodied um, a rich history and a story that was worthy of being told. And yet there were so many of them, it's impossible to tell them all. So 
that was interesting to me. The other thing that was interesting to me is, in my mind, I've always thought if I was in, if I was in a different circumstance, if I was born in a different place, if I had difficulty and needed to flee, needed to leave my homeland and go to another location for some reason in difficult circumstances, what would I bring? And in my mind, I was thinking to myself, I would be very practical. You know, I'd bring a pot and I'd bring pasta and rice or beans or something. I, I had all these practical things that I would bring with me. And there is one room on Ellis Island that was displayed behind glass were items that people who actually had to um, encounter difficult circumstances and then come to this land. These were the items that they had selected. The real people, not in my imagination, the real ones who had made this journey. And I was struck at how wrong I had been in the decision that I would have made. The things that they selected to come here were all connected to irreplaceable relationships, irreplaceable memories that they had. There were um, family heirlooms, little, little beautiful linen christening gowns for infants. There were um, toys that a grandfather had made a child. That You can replace a toy, of course, but these were things that had an emotional connection, a spiritual connection, and couldn't be replaced. Once you get to a new place, you can get your pasta, your rice, your beans, your big pot, whatever you need. But these were things that they decided were worthy to carry on their bundles to come to this land. And I would say that almost none of it was, in my mind, what I would have thought would have been practical. Practical. But everything they selected was something that would have helped them create a new home. And that to me was an education. That to me was um, very moving. And I was, um, I, was a, I was a wiser person. I was a wiser person at the end of that tour than I was walking in the door. So anyway, so that, that was what I was thinking about when we're moving our mom to her, her new home. And uh, it's a new place and a new time for her too, for our entire family. It's um, the closing of one book and it's the opening of another one. So um, that's what we're in the process of. I'm exhausted <laughs> and not done yet. And I can't complain at all because all of you have gone through um, much more than I can even imagine. But I'm looking forward to us being able to share stories together in the future. Mine won't even compare to yours, but um, I like to think that I'd have the opportunity to sit at the table with you and share a cup of tea. So anyway, so to the you newcomer, the you newcomers, those who are movers um, and shakers, um, I'm glad to be a part of your circle. Now, what I had done back to our lesson, what I had done um, in our in our time, is I posted requesting that those of you, and because of the moving date that was happening last weekend, I requested that we have like a um, a first opportunity for you to provide me with information that we could then use as a practical example of what's happening. And so what happened was different information came in and there was one, again, Merna, she provided me with a lovely audio clip which also was very compelling. I was telling her as I was listening to her speak it wasn't just an analysis, an objective analysis of what she had done. I could also hear a child's voice in the background, you know, running around and, and in the midst of her doing this business, I could also hear what was happening in her life. And it was, again, um, I, was, I was glad to be a part of it. Um, what we're going to talk about today are particular aspects of her submission that will help her, but also will help all of you, because they are things that I have encountered as a native speaker that I've heard amongst newcomers multiple times. And they are some things that you can work on now that over time will create even a muscular development in your palate that will assist you in your speaking communication for the TOEFL. And then after the TOEFL, in your higher education environment or in your professional environment. So 
What I want to do now is turn up the volume on your phones or turn up the volume on your laptops or your computer, wherever you're listening, because we're going to together be listening to an audio clip. We're going to listen to it twice. I want you to pay careful attention. It's about a minute long. It's not terribly long, but I want you to pay attention to what she's saying, and then we're going to be going over it. As a reminder, she is doing this in response to um, the inaugural address video that I posted of President John F. Kennedy and what he said when he came into office and swore his oath to serve the American people. So, all right, gentlemen, let's hear the audio. The inauguration of the President John Kennedy started when he swore that word God before people that he will preserve and protect and defend all the American institutions and he started to say toward all the president before him that today is not a victory of party but it's a celebration of freedom. It's a significant of renewal and the change and today the world is totally different. The man held in his mortal hand all the power to abolish all the form of human poverty and all the the form of human life and we should know that the right of man not come from the generosity of the state but from the hand of God we should not forget that we are the heirs of the first revolution let the world go forth from this time and the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century tempered by war disciplined by peace and we should be proud of our ancient heritage that not permit the slow of undoing of this human rights to which the nation has been committed Okay, and again, we're going to repeat it one more time. So listen again carefully. Again, turn up your volume. One more time, one more minute of Dear Mina's, Marina's voice. Thank you, gentlemen. The inauguration of the President John Kennedy started when he swore that word God before people that he will preserve and protect and defend all the American institutions and he started to say toward all the president before him that today is not a victory of party but it's a celebration of freedom. It's a significant of renewal and the change and today the world is totally different. The man held in his mortal hand all the power to abolish all the form of human poverty and all the form of human life and we should know that the right of man not come from the generosity of the state but from the hand of God we should not forget that we are the heirs of the first revolution let the world go forth from this time and the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century tempered by war disciplined by peace and we should be proud of our ancient heritage that not permit the slow of undoing of this human rights to which the nation has been committed All right, that was a woman who I have given the title of a hero scholar who uh, was able to overcome her fear and not worry about being perfect and submit that for our benefit. Um, I, got, I got the title hero scholar, it's based on a lecture that I heard years ago when I was in high school. Those of you who were in class, listened to our class lecture last week, or last time we had it, two weeks ago, I told you about perhaps my most important um, educator, a teacher that I've ever had in my life. It was in high school, even though I've gone through graduate degree, in high school I had probably the best teacher of my entire life. His name was William Donahue. And in his class, I had a couple different classes with him. I had a logic class with him, which I think I told you about the last time. But I also had a class called World Classics. And, you know, here's a kid in California, and we're reading, you know, we're reading Dante, the Inferno, and we're reading Shakespeare, and we're reading Plato, and we're reading even the Bible, but as literature. So we're reading these important monumental works and they opened my mind to so many things. One of the books that we were reading was The Republic by Plato and I think it was in The Republic. We, we read three different works of Plato's and I'm, I think it was in The Republic where there was a discussion that what Plato would do, um, those of you who are from Greece or who are in Greece currently, um, Plato, originally there was Socrates and then Socrates' student was Plato, 
And then Plato's student was Aristotle. And then Aristotle's stu student was Alexander the Great. So there is a fascinating intellectual progression there. But in Plato's works, he was writing about the dialogue that Socrates would have with his students. And Socrates would walk around, and he would just talk. And his students would ask questions, and he would respond, and he would challenge them to look at things in certain ways and to open their minds to different types of things. What Socrates did, and therefore Plato did in his writings, is that there was a concept that was brought up that Mr. Donahue, Mr. William Donahue, uh, presented to our class. And it was the idea of a philosopher king, someone who would be in a position of authority, responsible for others, a king. And yet he had, or she, had been trained in philosophy. So he or she was contemplative and was thorough and was diligent and was educated and was careful, understanding the responsibility to the public good and the burden that there is when one sits in a position of authority because of the risk of not just benefits for all but collateral damage to many if a mistake is made. And so there was an idea presented called the philosopher king, someone who was not just in a position of power and authority but someone who was worthy to be in a position of power and authority. And so when I think of Myrna and what she did, I'm calling her a scholar hero, a hero scholar, because to me, um, she wasn't, she's not just a student, just as you are not just students. There's also an element of a character development and a character demonstration in what you're doing. There's a, a bravery, there's a courage, there's a, um, an, a, a curiosity and excitement connected to education. And uh, so anyway, so that's, that's my name for her, as well as for you too, but she was the first. All right, now what I'd like to do is go over um, what I heard as a native speaker, and I want you to pay attention to as well. All right, on your screen you have the slide, but also I've written on the board here a couple of things I want us all to go over. To begin, I was impressed. Um, Myrna, she spoke so rapidly. She spoke so rapidly, uh, which I, I commend her on, but the TOEFL is a test for a higher education and for a professional environment, meaning that it's not like a common English that's required when you're on, you know, grocery shopping and you need to speak quickly and, and everyone speaks rapidly and s maybe even slurs their speech. Um, it is more formal. And because it's more formal, um, you have the opportunity to be more extravagant in your vocabulary choices, but also it's not necessary to speak as quickly because it's going to be in a different environment and you're much, you can be much more careful with your articulation. And therefore, if you speak slower, it's not that you're trying to beat the test and not have to say as much, <laughs> but I think it's a good idea to not run out of time. And one of the ways you can work through that is to slow the speed of your language. And I think it's very important. I will tell you that in grad school that I went to, even to get into the program, required you to have a, a management level to even apply for the program and to, to be accepted. And so everyone in my program, they were all management or administrative level within their fields, and it was multidisciplinary. So we had finance, engineering, um, medical health care, education, public service, etc. We had many different industries represented. Everyone in there was a management level or administrative level within their field, but they wanted to pursue this degree. It was a, a, an MBA, so a Master's of Business Administration. So again, I'm, everyone there is, is getting up there in terms of um, influence within their chosen field. Now what I noticed, it was really interesting, um, of all the challenges that we face, because all of this coming from many different disciplines, and each of us, because of our background, would have 
a strength in one thing or another. The engineers were excellent in the statistics because of the quantitative work that they would be doing when they were developing experiments. Um, the finance people were excellent at the math mathematics that were required, like for option pricing models for managerial finance. So because they were comfortable with using those numbers in their regular life, they did excelled in those classes. However, across all industries, across the entire student population, public speaking was the challenge for all of them. Public speaking. And when you take your test, your mastery of English is only one of the components that you will be tested on. Um, if you look at the rubrics that I posted before, and I actually we're going to go over it again in our class today, mastery of the vocabulary and syntax and grammar is one aspect of it, but also delivery and your organization and your logical progression, those are strongly uh, associated with success. So again, it's not that you're trying to beat the test. It's that you're going to become familiar with what is the content. And even if your English isn't perfect, if you are comfortable with public speaking and how to organize yourself to speak extemporaneously, that means without just simply reciting a speech you've already prepared, those things will help you in your success. And again, not just on the TOEFL for admission to higher education or for pro professional certification, but it's a forecast of what will help you be successful in those environments. All right, so what I'm going towards in this conversation is if you are going to be speaking in a professional capacity in front of people, you need to slow your language down. Honestly, like I'm speaking to you. If I'm going to you know, the grocery store or to the gas station, I don't speak this way. But I want to be certain that to the best of my ability that I assist you in my communication. So I slow my language down. I honestly, I wear dark lipstick so that you can watch my mouth, so that you can understand how I'm forming my sounds. And so I'm doing my best as a public speaker to help you understand what I'm saying. Um, part of this is actually my mother has lost her hearing and she lost her hearing later in life. And so she doesn't know signing. She doesn't know sign language. So because of that, I assist her, she's brilliant at reading lips. So the things that I do actually to help her can help someone who's doing public speaking. Again, looking straight at someone, being careful how you form your words, slowing your tempo down. So that's the first recommendation that I would have after listening to the audio. Myrna, if you slow it down, you actually will extend the amount of time that you're speaking, which can fulfill the requirement when you're actually doing your TOEFL and it will assist the listener in understanding what you're trying to convey. All right, And that's a lesson for all of us. The first class, to take it personally, the first class that I did with you, um, we have a whole team here actually and as I was speaking one of the gentlemen in working in the production crew, the team, he wrote up a big note for me. It said slow down. <laughs> so we're never, um, we're never too old to learn, thank God. So there we are. Next, um, this is something, the intonation that she used, this is something that intonation is, what is the music of the language? Is it staccato or is it fluid? Those who are Spanish language natives, or Arabic native speakers, there is more of a staccato intonation in your language instead of like a melody that's like a wave in how you use the breath going through your palate to form the sounds. Um, to give you an example, um, okay, so Spanish. Eri con eri cigarro, eri con eri baril, 
rápidos del carril en los carros, los carros del ferrobarrio. Okay, that's a that's a, um, a, a, a a little lesson that they give you when you're taking Spanish. All right. So there's Spanish. Now here's an associated language, uh, French, right? Um, okay. Rappelle-toi, Barbara, il pleuvait sans cesse sur la Brest. That's a, um, a part of a poem from a, a poet named Baudelaire. Rappelle-toi, Barbara, Barbara, il pleuvait sans cesse sur la Brest. So it sounds du -du 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 -du. So it's more like a wave, yeah? Um, also what you'll find is in some languages that the breath that comes past your teeth, it will stop. So Spanish does that. If you hold a piece of paper in front of your mouth as you speak, the piece of paper will not move very much. Eric Oneri Cigarro, Eric Oneri Baril, Rapidos del Carren Los Carros. All right, so the breath as it comes through your palate, especially if you're dealing with a staccato intonation, it stops more at your teeth as opposed to a melody. Now, what I notice with Merna is she exhibits a pattern that you hear when people are perhaps Arabic speakers or Spanish speakers. There's more of a staccato intonation. Now what's interesting, um, you can speak the exact same language as another person, but the intonation can give an exhibition of what region you're from. For example, if you hear French, and, and I'm using French only because I'm more familiar with it, but I'm using it as an example. Parisian French has this melody, this wave of sound that comes through. If you hear French that's spoken in Quebec, Quebecois, it actually has that intonation of a staccato. So the first time I heard Quebecois, which was French, but it was spoken with that staccato intonation, it was interesting for me because I was able to understand it pretty quickly because the consonants provided really strong road, road marks or landmarks for my ear to be able to capture. But the intonation was different, so I could tell they weren't from Paris, right? So the intonation that Marina has was more staccato. And what you'll find in English, especially if you're doing a public speaking, is you'll find that someone speaks, they go up and they go down like in a wave. And the purpose is for emphasis, the purpose is for comprehension, but it's also, depending on where you're from, it's also an exhibition of the region you're from. Um, and there are differences even within English. For example, if you are from England, if you're from England, sometimes if you ask a question, uh, there is like any, in American English you would say, is there class today? Is there class today? If you were from England, you might say, is there class today? Or it depends, or I, I'm sorry, the reverse. So you'll, you'll have the intonation. So in American, you'll go down. Is there, cl or American will go up. Is there class today? And if you're English, you would say, is there class today? So you hear how the, there's like, you go up or you go down, that wave. I hope that's, that's making sense. But as the more you listen to a language, the more familiar you, you will get with what is the melody or the music of that. There's a, there is a, um, there is, your ears will be trained. So if you listen to news broadcasts, if you listen to the radio, if you listen to a music coming from in the native tongue of the country you're going to be going to or the country you've immigrated to, that will assist you with that too. Okay, now, next, also um, R's. This is something that I encounter with those who are native Arabic speakers or native Spanish speakers. You will, um, you will roll your R's. So your R's in English, an American palate will never roll an R. We don't do that. <laughs> we don't do that. Um, unless we're pronouncing, for example, someone's name 
in an appropriate way from their country of origin or a, a proper name, like Ricardo, Ricardo. Um, you will do. You will roll your R's in Spanish, in Italian, in Arabic, and in other languages. So to let you know, when I'm listening to Merna, <laughs> when I'm listening to her pronunciation, it doesn't on the R's interfere with my comprehension of what she's saying. It does, though, let me know where she's from. And that's not a bad thing. It doesn't interfere with the meaning of the words, all right? But to let you know, it's something that someone who's a native speaker will spot. If you roll your R's, they'll know that you are not native-born English speaker. You are perhaps Arabic speaker, perhaps Spanish, perhaps Italian, etc. Okay? However, um, oops, the R's weren't as Z's, are rolled. They were rolled. TH is a different thing though, and I want to concentrate on TH and how that is pronounced. Because while you roll your R's, if you roll your R's, it doesn't interfere with the meaning of the word. If you do your TH's incorrectly, it can actually interfere with what word you're going to be saying. All right? So, I want to concentrate on THs. There is a slide that's just gone up that gives you some examples of TH, and I'm, go I'm going to pronounce them as a native speaker. And then I'm going to, the next slide though, I'm after this one, I'm going to be digging down and giving you more information on it. So, the, they, thanks, bath, math, three, those, these, think, brother, there, that, father, 30, mother. Now, sometimes when I do my THs, it's just breath. Sometimes there's a vibration. So this time I'm going to do it, and I want you to actually, if you can, as you're speaking, put your hand on your throat, okay? Sometimes you're going to have a vibration if you're doing it right, and sometimes you won't. The they thanks bath math three those vibration these vibration think no vibration brother there that father thirty mother. All right? Sometimes a TH has a vibration, sometimes it doesn't. Now what Marino was doing is she was, and this I, I see this frequently, and the vibration, she's acquiring the vibration, but instead of saying it there, she has her tongue behind her teeth. And so because her tongue is behind her teeth, it comes out like a Z. So her Z Okay, her TH becomes a Z. So it's z zer um mother father. So the tongue is behind the teeth and it becomes a Z. That is going to be a landmark for someone to be able to know that you're not a native speaker, which is fine. But if you can do certain things to reduce your accent, for those who are not acclimated to listening to a newcomer, it will help them understand you more easily. Plus, I want you to develop new muscles. And this is something I can't I, I've told you this before, I can't protect you and I can't save you from having to do the work <laughs> of learning English. You're going to be developing new muscles and that actually takes time. Those of you who are athletes, those of you who have had an injury and have had to rehabilitate, you know that there, there takes time to develop infrastructure to be able to support what you're trying to do. 
that actually happens with your palate. Um, there's a couple, there's different, there's different uh, um, important marks when you're learning language. And I've heard some disputes one way or the other, but it has to do with um, biology, how are, we're put together to be able to acquire language, first of all, for survival. You know, children, when you're a child, when you're an infant, you're absorbing everything in the environment very quickly, and you're able to learn language with idiomatic fluency, more languages with idiomatic fluency. The age of seven, if you learn language before the age of seven, and you learn it the right way, then you are able to learn multiple languages with idiomatic fluency. And that means that when I hear a word, I'm not translating it and then releasing my response. A word comes in, whether it's in one or three different languages, I can learn it and then just simply respond. So you dream. When you dream in a language with idiomatic fluency, when you dream in a language, that means you have idiomatic fluency as an example. It's one of the one of the things they look for. So by the age of seven, if you can learn, then that helps. Another, another signpost to look for in terms of language acquisition is the age of 13. And this may have to do with both the age of seven and the age of 13. It might have to do with um, neurological response, neurological development, neurotransmitters, hormone levels which change, etc. But by the age of 13, your palate begins to harden. And what that means is your palate, which is your supportive structure, your musculature, etc., when they form around the language that you're speaking, then you tend to not be able to speak with no accent if you learn another language. You can still learn another language and you can still dream in another language and have idiomatic fluency, but a native speaker will always be able to hear something because the way the breath from your body is formed and comes out of your palate, there will be a difference between a native speaker if you learn after the age of 13. But that's okay, as long as it doesn't interfere with communication. Honestly, for me, when I hear accents, I am fascinated because to me, it's, uh, it's an opportunity to hear about someone's story, just like you know, going through Ellis Island. I want to know what's going on and what brought them to meet with me face to face. I want to hear what's happening with them. So having an accent is not bad. There's accents within the United States, for example, very strong accents. And there's some parts of the United States which I can't even understand what people are saying and vice versa. So even within a language, as a native speaker, there are, are accents that are different. And, um, and that's not bad. It, again, can be an opportunity for us to learn more about each other. What I think is fascinating, I, think, I was thinking about what would be my ideal job, which I, I don't even know if it exists, but I'd love to be a linguistic anthropologist trying to figure out how language developed because the way people put things together the, the root of it is people are trying to understand each other. They're trying to figure out a way to connect. Um, the development of creolization or patois in a language, what happens is you have many different people coming to an area and they need to communicate somehow. And what happens is each person from different places, different languages, comes to a decision to smooth out the difficult sounds that are made in their language and they develop something that's universally understood. For example, um, um, okay, there's, there's Saint Lucia in French as an example. Saint Lucia is an island. On Saint Lucia, there is a mountain, Mont Pawasso. There's a mountain, Mont Pawasso, on Saint Lucia, right? Well, it's called Mont Pawasso. It was originally a French colony, but many, you know, there were many different peoples who came in. There were, it was a slave population brought in. Uh, yes, but people had to communicate, right? So you have this Montpawasso, which once upon a time in French was Mont Parasol, Mont Parasol, the umbrella mountain. Yeah? Well, if someone is not a native French speaker, 
and they have to figure out how to communicate. You're going to take out the the nasal because not everyone has a palate to be able to do you're going to say mo, not mo, you're going to say mo. So the vibration's not going to go through the nasal cavity, it'll just simply be breath coming out, mo. And parasol, parasol, you're not going to do the r because some palates aren't formed to be able to easily say that. So parasol becomes pawasol, pawasol. Everything out, just simple breath coming through, no vibration through different passages. So mon parasol becomes mo pawasol. So what happens here is, again, I, I like to see how people are able to figure out how to communicate with each other, yeah? So that's what happens when you're, when you're figuring out how to deal with your accent. Um, you don't want to erase it, and you actually can't erase it. Your palate is formed by the age of 13, but you can minimize it, and you need to develop new musculature. And the more you work, just like when you were at the gym, the more you work, the stronger you'll get and the more able you'll be able to form the sounds in the proper way. Uh, I have a friend who's a musician who told me, and I think it's true, that actually the human voice is truly a wind instrument. Your breath comes through your vocal cords and goes through vibrations, through different channels and creates a sound. And so think of this as being an instrument, an instrument that can create beauty for you, create opportunity for you, communication, but it needs to be worked on. You need to develop musculature, all right? So um, I wanna show you the next slide. I wanna show you some different, different THs, okay? Um, this, and if, you, if, we're, if you're in a place you can do this, put your hand on your throat, and I want you to practice the THs that have vibration or the THs that do not. A TH can come in the beginning of a word, the middle of a word, or the end of a word. And sometimes they have vibration, sometimes they do not. For example, tooth, no vibration, tooth, but the word smooth. Both of those have a TH at the end of the word, but one has a vibration and one does not. Tooth smooth, this, or think. This has a vibration, think does not. Okay, so we're going to do this together. This, that, these, those, three, thirty, thanks, think other, leather, weather, lather, father, mother, brother, feather, tooth, bath, health, broth, teeth, both, booth, earth. Okay, so again, TH can happen any location. Gentlemen, um, it's important though, um, again, thinking about where the breath is coming through. This, this, uh, this lesson for today, we're going to be posting this, included an, is one of the slides that shows actually different sounds, how they are formed, and how, they, how you can work on that. Again, beginning to develop the musculature of your palate to be able to execute those sounds accurately. The TH sound, and this is something that with some people from different, different languages, um, I've encountered challenges for them. The tongue must be on the outside of your teeth to make the TH correctly. Um, those who speak Spanish who are like from Central America or South America, they tend not to have, tr to have more trouble than this, on this. Um, they, they tend to have their tongue behind. 
they oftentimes will end up with a Z sound like those, like Merna does as well. If you are Spanish, say from Barcelona, you'll find the TH is not a problem because how they've learned Spanish, the accent allows for the tongue to be in front of the teeth. So with the TH in English, you need to practice having your tongue outside your teeth, <laughs> outside your teeth. Because if you don't, you'll end up with the wrong words, okay? So on the diagram here, I actually, this is for future reference. We're not gonna be talking about the L sound today. The R sound we talked about a little bit, TH sound, and the S sound. Now to let you know, I, you might notice it a little bit, but I have a problem with my S's. And I'm, again, native born, but the way my palate is formed, I have a tendency to do very strong S's. And when I was in junior high, um, a speech teacher, I was starting to get into, you know, speech, you know, speech performances and debate and that sort of thing. And she noticed it and she would stop me as I was speaking in public because my S's were too strong. And so I consciously stopped my S's because I would love to just, <laughs> and they whistle and it's, so I have to um, change the way I form sounds too. So to, to let you know, so it, that's more of a speech impediment as opposed to an accent, but everyone has got a challenge somewhere. So, um, and the R which we talked about, R is the tip of your tongue does not go to the roof of your mouth, R, R, unless, and if you're trilling it, going rrr, rrr, your tongue not only is hitting the tip, top of your mouth, it is vibrating back and forth, like R, R, cigarro, and you'll do that in Spanish, Italian, French, uh, not French, yeah, not French, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, rrr, so, but if you're doing English, you don't rrr, vibrate your R's. You say cigar, cigar. You don't say cigarro, all right? So TH. Now I wanna show you why TH is very important. Um, if you don't do your TH correctly, let's go to the next one actually. There's some more, um, some more another slide there where you can practice on. Um, there, the one with the next, there, perfect. If you don't do your TH correctly, you can end up misleading your, li your listener and you might be actually saying the wrong word. This is very important. So, for example, um, thick. If your tongue is not in front of your teeth, you will say sick. Exact everything else is the same, but if your tongue is in front or behind, it actually changes the meaning of the word that you're saying, and it can cause tremendous confusion for your listener. So, thick or sick. Myth or miss. Myth or miss. There was actually a comedian, uh, a comedy skit years ago. It, was, it wasn't a skit, it actually was a movie. It was, ca it was called Airplane. It was a spoof on disaster movies. And um, one of the guys who was, one of the actors, he was saying something was a myth. It, was, it wasn't true, it was a legend, it was just a myth. And every time he would say myth, this woman would stick her head out and she'd say, yes? So she, was, she thought he, he was calling her a miss. Anyway, so myth or miss. Um, Earth, and actually I crossed that out because of culturally appropriate, I took this diagram to show you, but Earth said without the th, but a s can, can, means another word, means a human body part. Um, theater, theater, or theater. Thank or sank. Thank or sank. Think or sink, all right? So I, will, I want to emphasize to you the importance of where you place your tongue. Now, as you're starting to do this, um, fear 
is your enemy. Fear is your enemy. Shyness is fear. It is your enemy. Don't worry about pronouncing something in an awkward way. The more you, pronu you pronounce with your tongue in the right location, the more natural it will feel, the more musculature you'll develop, as well as your neurological system will come alongside and you'll be firing on all pistons, as we say in English, which means that as an engine, you'll be working well, all right? So keep practicing it. Um, it's a, a, some of you will, will not feel comfortable with it, but press through that. It's not only an issue of accent, it is again an issue of um, truly conveying the accurate meaning of the words that you're saying. So, thick or sick, myth or miss, theater or seater, thank or sank, think or sink, all right? Um, this all is important. I, this is dense information you're seeing on your screen, which is the rubrics for the independent speaking section of TOEFL. Um, this is too dense for you to see as we're talking now, but I'm posting it so that afterwards you can pull it up. This is your Bible. This is your roadmap. This is your compass on how to get the scores you need. This is how your assessors will determine what is your score when you take this test. So you need to understand what they're looking for. And you probably want to have a three or a four in all the sections to be able to accomplish what you're, you're going towards. And so you need to understand just diagnostically what they're looking for. So I'm posting this again. I think I posted it a couple of lessons ago, but I'm posting it again for you. Each one of the TOEFL sections has a very particular um, list, a, a very particular rubrics that will, again, be diagnostic for you. This is your ingredient list. These are the components they're looking for, for your scoring, all right? So on the next, um, the next slide that you see, I actually took the threes and the fours and just pulled those out specifically so that you can see this is the level you want to go towards. All right, just generally a four is going to have a response that fulfills the task and it will have only minor lapses in completeness. It is highly intelligible and exhibits sustained coherent discourse. A response at this level is characterized by delivery, language use, and topic development all at a certain level. And read diagnostically what each of those are. And again, like I have, I re referred to in a previous class, your vocabulary, your syntax is only part of it. Another part is your delivery and your topic development. Topic development is how you organize your thoughts, public speaking, or thesis development, or a syllogism how you write a news article, if you're a journalist, who, what, where, when, why, how you develop a topic, all right? None of that is English. That is all simply language, simply communication. So whatever background you've come from, that section, how to develop a topic and to organize your thoughts, that you've ar you're already bringing with you, all right? It's public speaking. But it of oftentimes is the most challenging for many people. Again, when I was in grad school with people who were successful in their industries, that seemed to be the one that was a challenge for across the board, all right? So your topic development, your delivery, which again goes back to using Myrna as an example, your speed, your intonation, right? Language use is the third category that, that rolls into creating your comprehensive score. That is where your vocabulary, your syntax, your grammar use, those are where your mastery of the English language will most clearly be displayed, all right? So I wanted you to see those again. Again, those are diagnostic. Those are the target that you're shooting for. And together we'll work on those bit by bit, all right? Um, our next class is going to be on the 28th, which is a week from today. We'll be meeting um, at 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, which until 
p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I think that I posted for you on uh, our WhatsApp and then also on our Facebook page some things which are American cultural dynamics which can cause confusion or that are strange. And one of them is where we put the dates. You know, it's, the, it's July the 28th, 2019, as opposed to the 28th of July, 2019. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, so just I wanted to, you know, just point that out. Um, I, uh, America has got some quirks, and that's where I live. If you're planning on, on immigrating to America as opposed to, to Canada or to England or to Australia or other English speaking countries, and you need to take the TOEFL, America has some unique quirks. And we're by no means perfect, by no means perfect. But to be very frank, we become better and better as time goes by if we work on it together. We would not be the country that we are without, uh, without people from throughout the world coming together and bringing the best of what they are and helping us be stronger together. And that's why I'm here, because I want to create a pathway for you to be able to land here and to be able to bring your hopes and your dreams and establish a new life. And through that, all of us become so much richer, so much richer, and life becomes a great deal sweeter, I would say. So um, one last thing, um, I would like to thank Myrna again. Thank you so much, my currently unmet sister. Thank you so much for being so brave. Um, I call her our lab rat which in English means um, she's been willing to, for us to experiment on her. And I really appreciate that courage. And you've given us an example of um, how to be heroic in the midst of education and to be willing to be examined by all of us throughout the world. You're my hero and I wanna thank you again. And I'm so glad that you're a part of this. And to all of you, I am so glad that we're all a part of this together. And I'm very much looking forward to being able to be in front of you again. I'm very much looking forward to us connecting and figuring out ways for us to form a community and a future for all of us here. So until then, until next week, may peace be with you and thank you.